evening to everybody who was able to uh, join us today. Um, this is a special webinar. Uh, it is a, a, a double-hatted webinar because uh, it is a webinar that we are sharing uh, with our wonderful partners, socialprotection.org, who have been a bastion of knowledge and, and resources uh, throughout this uh, uh, COVID-19 crisis. And they are continuing to provide a, a wonderful analysis and resources week by week uh, in the form of newsletter, in the form of webinars. So this is actually the 21st webinar of their um, social protection responses to COVID-19 series. And it is also the fourth and last, the closing webinar of the uh, International Training Center of the ILO's course on, uh, on the e-coaching on social protection towards responsive systems. So thank you to our audience of course participants and thank you to our broader audience that was brought on board today by socialprotection.org for joining us for this, uh, for this really exciting uh, webinar. We have, a, uh, we have a great lineup of uh, panelists today and uh, we are, uh, we're very lucky to have them and I'm looking forward to engaging with them in, uh, in conversation. So, um, Julio, can you show the next slide, please? So social protection responses to COVID-19, uh, the, uh, the series that um, socialprotection.org uh, has been leading is a joint effort, uh, uh, which is inspired by colleagues and organizations working to disseminate and discuss uh, the most recent content on social protection responses to the crisis. Um, so, as I've said, it's, it, it's actually a, a comprehensive uh, initiative, which includes a special edition of a dedicated newsletter. If you haven't signed up yet, make sure you do, because it's a, a fantastic resource for getting the latest information and analysis. Um, they run weekly webinars to foster discussions, exchanges, of very, very interesting topics, very varied and interesting topics. And they also host an online community um, to systematize the, the information gathered through this effort uh, as, we, uh, as we're going through this pandemic. So it's, uh, uh, it's a brilliant, brilliant uh, initiative, which I encourage all of you, including our course participants, to join if you haven't yet done so. Uh, next slide, please. In the webinar series, of course, there is today's webinar, but also the next webinars will be open to everyone as they always are, but we are encouraging uh, the uh, course participants uh, from the ITC course to join uh, the weekly webinars organized by socialprotection.org. The one that will run next week, next Tuesday, 14th July, uh, will be focusing on human rights uh, in social protection responses to COVID-19. We will be providing information on the uh, webinar series organized by socialprotection.org on the course platform as we go along and we encourage uh, all participants to, uh, to join these webinars on a weekly basis because this is in fact the closing webinar with external speakers that is for the course and, uh, and so we hope that you will keep being inspired by the webinar series organized by our partners, socialprotection.org. So, turning our attention to today, I've said many things in our webinar series about COVID-19 and we all know, uh, uh, you know, this, this is a human crisis. We've said everything and, and I would really like to move from rhetoric to action today, to really thinking through and joining the dots as to what needs to be done. This is, uh, we've, all the other webinars in the series have mostly looked back. In this webinar, we're looking ahead. So, you know, what can you say? The COVID-19 pandemic hit the world 
with unprecedented speed. We've said that. I mean, it, it, it's triggered the deepest human crisis uh, and, and the deepest economic downturn for decades. It's been, uh, it's been compared to uh, uh, the end of World War II. It's been compared to the Great Depression of the 1930s. Uh, in truth, we, we always knew uh, that we were vulnerable to the next pandemic, and we still are. And, uh, and many saw it coming. I, for one, have worked in public health many years, so uh, it wasn't news to me that it was going to happen sooner or later. Yet it's, it's sheer magnitude, the complexity, the depth of this specific crisis that has made it unprecedented. Moreover, COVID-19 and uh, what I saw referred as the great lockdown, uh, which I think is a, is a very good term, uh, hit the world at a time when most global economies were already struggling. It has been described as a trend accelerator, most notably in, uh, in our webinar on Tuesday, but it can also become a game changer in economic, social and political terms. At the end of the day, we simply don't know what lies ahead. But what we do know is that health and social protection measures and systems have proved once again to be essential lifesavers in time of crisis. COVID-19 catalyzed a complete reversal of policies in many countries where governments poured unprecedented resources into strengthening and extending their social protection systems in order to keep their people alive and afloat. Social protection provided the means to weather the storm but the storm is, is far from over, we know that, and it is likely that things may get worse, as we've heard as well in this uh, webinar series, uh, before they get any better. So maintaining the goodwill and, and this momentum on, on social protection in order to build back better, which has now become a mantra, strengthening social protection systems and floors so that we can see this crisis through a better, uh, we can see this crisis through and, and better prepare for the next shock will be paramount. So today, as I said, we're looking forward. This is, uh, this is what we want to focus on. We're boldly staring into the future, into the unknown, and we have four thought leaders on social protection from four UN agencies to help us uh, make sense of what has happened to us and help us chart the road ahead. We've heard so much about what's been happening on the ground through phases one and two of this, uh, of this course. Um, what's been happening at, at the front line of the social protection response to, uh, uh, to COVID-19. As we now raise our line of sight to what there is ahead and, and we want to look at what needs to change, we must join the dots from the ground up to the very top up to the international decision-making, uh, up to the UN system. Um, I was just reading a, a, a brief earlier to prepare for this session, and it reminded me of something that we, um, we spoke about on Tuesday on a, uh, for a webinar for this series. Um, Stephen Kidd was telling us about the missing middle, and the, so far I would say that the lack of, of concrete international solidarity and coordinated response at the international decision-making level probably makes us look at a missing top. That's an interesting concept, I guess, and that's what we need to reflect on today. Uh, you know, how can we regroup? How can we coordinate and strategize together? And that's exactly what I'm going to be asking our uh, panelists our esteemed panelists today. Before I go into uh, properly asking them questions, I wanted to introduce them all to you. So we're delighted to have Shara Razavi with us. Shara is the uh, director of the Social Protection Department at the International Labour Organization. Before joining the ILO, she was chief of the research and data section at the at UN Women and senior research at the United Nations Research Institute for Social Development, working at the interface in gender, social policy and care economy. So a very interesting background, Shara. Research and gender. I'm sure you're going to be drawing on that today. And then we, we're lucky to have Natalia Winder-Rossi 
Natalia Windorossi is a long-standing expert and friend uh, in the field of social protection uh, with field experience in Latin America and Eastern and Southern Africa. She is currently a newly appointed Associate Director of Programs, Global Chief of Social Policy at UNICEF. She manages the social policy agenda, including social protection, child poverty, local governance, and public finance for children. Before that, she led FAO's social protection team. And she was, uh, uh, she was a colleague of Benjamin Davis. <laughs> so Benjamin Davis uh, is the strategic uh, program leader rural poverty reduction for the UN Food and Agriculture Organization. He has extensive experience in social protection, social policies, and agricultural economics. He has previously served as Deputy Director of the Agricultural uh, Development Economics Division at FAO, and he was team leader of the From Production to Protection project which has a very interesting title, and I'm sure we'll hear uh, uh, something about that as well and, uh, and what that entails today. He's also worked as a social policy advisor for the UNICEF regional office in Eastern and Southern Africa and as a research, uh, and uh, he was a research and postdoctoral fellow at IFPRI. And finally, Sarah Lawton, we're delighted to have Sarah with us all the way from Canada. Um, she is Chief of the Social Protection Unit at the UN World Food Programme headquarters in Rome, uh, where she oversees the organization's portfolio in this area of work, providing strategic guidance and support to regional bureau and country offices around the globe. Now, Sarah has 20 years experience in both humanitarian and development work. Uh, she supported large scale emergency responses and promoted food security and promoted food security and nutrition in contexts of um, fragility in some of the most uh, remote settings in the world. So you're a new, uh, newcomer to crises and, uh, and shocks, I would say, Sarah. So I'm delighted, as I said, to be able to engage in uh, conversation with our panelists today. And we will do things a little differently today. For those of you that have followed our webinar series before, uh, I'm talking about our course participants. I'll be asking them questions and encouraging them to engage in a dialogue with each other. So we won't have the usual PowerPoint presentation moving on to the next panelist. We'll try to do shake things up a little today and see, uh, see how that goes. Um, as always, uh, the audience will be able to uh, post written questions and you can do that by using the Q&A uh, chat at the bottom. For those of you that are new to this uh, format, you will see there's an icon at the bottom of your screen with Q&A written on it, which is a bit of a giveaway. And um, our panelists have promised to uh, look at your questions and try to answer any that may be addressed to them. Okay, so I hope that will work. It worked brilliantly last time. And um, without further ado, I would like to turn my attention to Shara to begin with. Shara, what is it that, what's the key challenge? What, what keeps you awake at night thinking about everything that we've been through, of course, but mostly thinking about social protection in a post COVID world? We don't know what that looks like, but, but what is it? What, what do you think about? Um, thank you so much uh, for the introduction. And I think it's a, just let me say, it's a, it's a real ple pleasure and privilege to be sharing uh, this panel with all of the uh, highly experienced and wonderful colleagues who are around this, this virtual table. Um, just to go straight to your um, question, I think, I think it's really important, as you said, to sort of first kind of recognize uh, the kind of historical moment that I think we're in. Um, I mean, in some ways, 
this particular crisis uh, like some of the previous crises, you know, 2008 as the global sort of big crisis that we had. But then before that, we had a whole series of regional crises, you know, um, East Asia in Latin America. So, you know, we've been going through uh, one crisis after another. And this crisis in many ways, I think, brought out even more clearly, um, you know, the fundamental kind of necessity, if you like, for all countries of having already systems of social protection in place that can kick in automatically uh, when you are confronted with such uh, a major, um, you know, health crisis on the one hand, but also very quickly uh, that uh, particular health crisis, it morphed into a kind of economic and social crisis of, as you said, and we have all been saying, you know, unprecedented proportions and, and something we had not really seen um, in, recent, in recent years. Um, so with that, I think, has come this kind of very uh, wide, uh, widespread awareness on the part of uh, many different countries, not only general publics, but also decision makers, of the importance of building these social protection systems uh, and having them there um, before the next crisis comes. Because I think this is, again, something that mm, people have been saying, you know, this was a kind of, you know, sharp reminder of what we're going to see over the next years to come with the climate, with the existential crises coming from uh, our climate crisis. So I think the challenge that really we are confronted with on the one hand is that, you know, there have been uh, countries have put in measures, uh, sometimes on the run very quickly. Uh, there have been uh, relatively significant sums of money going into, um, into social protection as, as well as um, uh, health care uh, services in many countries. Um, and one worry is that, you know, after this um, sort of um, level of expenditure that we've seen, which have, has of course not been at all at the same level in, in many developing countries, but still um, we have seen at least a relative expansion in uh, the expenditure level that we're going to be confronted with, uh, with, a, with a call for kind of, you know, austerity, particularly at a time when many developing countries don't have the kind of revenues that they always had, whether it was from commodity exports, whether it was from garment exports, whether it was from tourism or remittances, and the level of um, debt that they have to the, that they have to service. I mean, unless there's a solution for that particular problem. Um, so the challenge really is how to confront, um, you know, that call and prevent a call for austerity and continue to build on the momentum that we now have uh, to really turn a lot of the temporary measures that we have in place into more permanent institutionalized um, parts of a social protection system. Uh, and building these robust social protection systems that can really be able to provide significant social and economic payoffs because they do have economic payoffs. We know that from the history of countries, you know, many of them developed countries that have historically built these social protection systems, these universal systems, they do have economic payoffs and uh, they're not just social policies. They're also, um, you know, they have very significant um, um, uh, payoffs for economies in general, particularly in periods of crisis, as we know, they kind of boost aggregate demand, they get economies out of recession. So it's a real necessity at this moment. But this requires mobilization of um, significant fiscal resources to be sure, you know, and we need to put in place progressive taxes, income taxes, wealth taxes, and we also need elements of solidarity within the global financial system to be able for countries that are in a much weaker position and have a much smaller sort of fiscal space to be able to expand their fiscal resources so that they can continue to um, sustainably um, build up their social protection systems. But also it means having much more, I think, administrative capacities, and that means also significantly administrative capacities of the state, because, um, you know, a social protection system will only hold together and do the job that it's supposed to do if you have, you know, a high level capacity state that's able to oversee it. And uh, it's really uh, no secret that no other institution can replace the state. And this, uh, I think, is one other lesson from this, from this crisis. So we need to build up that administrative capacity at the same time that we're building up uh, the fiscal capacity, while at the same time ensuring that organizations of workers and employers uh, and other civil society organizations, those who speak on behalf of the beneficiaries of these systems, are really able to also hold the state to account so that we have 
a kind of social contract, if you like, which is another necessity for a sustainable social protection system. Um, and also we know that social protection systems going forward not only have to be robust and comprehensive and adequate, but also they need to be able to be responsive to new social needs. And uh, we have needs that are huge in terms of um, the health um, uh, system that needs to respond, to respond to the current pandemic and future pandemics to come, which is no secret to anyone but also the many challenges that are coming with climate change, as well as other changes, demographic changes. I mean, this crisis has made, made very clear the huge needs of a growing uh, population um, of older persons who've been particularly vulnerable in this, in this current crisis, but also the need for care, for uh, long-term care for, uh, um, for people who are frail, um, older persons with sort of frailties that need support. Um, so these are all the challenges that are ahead of us. And I think uh, one of the advantages of kind of investing also in social protection systems, as well as in things like long-term care systems, uh, childcare services, long-term services, is that we're also able at the same time through this um, sector to create uh, a significant uh, number of jobs. And if these are decent jobs and you know, formalized, then uh, you can also recuperate a lot of the um, um, initial fiscal outlay through the tax and transfer system as you get more people who are employed formally and contribute to um, uh, the social protection system, the social insurance system. So you can get also a shift in a kind of employment towards sectors that are really m uh, of great need and necessity. And in many countries, we currently have proportions of, you know, patients to nurses and patients to doctors that are uh, really um, not, not, not sustainable in terms of being able to provide uh, decent and quality health care. So there's a lot more to be done in building the social protection system and investing in the kind of services that can complement to really guarantee uh, the rights to social security that are so clearly um, enshrined in all of our um, sort of uh, human rights standards. Um, so I think, you know, building that back better will, uh, will necessitate, as I said, you know, expansion and building uh, into um, the fiscal capacities, the administrative capacities, and the democratic um, needs for having a system that's transparent, accountable, and responsive to the beneficiaries, so that trust in the system also increases. Thank you, Shara. I think that's a very comprehensive agenda, and we're, we're jumping the gun here, uh, which is great. You're uh, on a roll. Um, yes, uh, I, well, I particularly like the um, from temporary to permanent, I think that is uh, that is definitely uh, key because we've seen a, a, a surge of temporary measures, as, as you said. I mean, the ILO and UNICEF and others, the World Bank. You know, we've all been monitoring what's been happening at the global level, but it's how much of this we will be able to sustain. So, Natalia, what keeps you awake at night? What uh, what have you been? Uh, uh, have you been doing some scenarios planning in UNICEF as well? I, I know that you know you've been at the forefront as as everybody else has of the of the response. But what particularly what particular challenges are worrying you right now? Thanks, Constanza, and thanks to all for the invitation. And I am also very happy to be able to share the panel with friends and and colleagues that I respect very much. Um, for those that know me, I do actually keep myself awake thinking about these things, uh, literally. Um, and definitely I have to agree with the first point posed by Shara around, there's a lot of excitement that governments were finally recognizing the social protection was actually very critical. Um, but yes, unfortunately, a lot of the measures have been very short term, have been um, either building on systems or really with a very uh, with an end in sight, no. And 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 I'm and in, and I think the majority also focus on social assistance and cash-based interventions, which are critical, but are definitely not the whole picture and the whole um, systems approach that we want to really make sure to to take advantage of. I think if we don't take advantage of this momentum to to actually address the key coverage and adequacy gaps that are being very critically highlighted in the, in the context of this pandemic, we will definitely miss a critical opportunity. And of course, from our side, even though children have not been the face of the crisis, the critical and the obvious poverty and socioeconomic impacts have a very 
long-standing impacts on their well-being you know, in terms of education in terms of health but also in terms of child protection gender uh, violence and others um, very very much linked to what um, Shara mentioned We've been looking at the system, I think, putting a lot of emphasis on, I think, cash based and social assistance because it's where we had most of the evidence, I have to say, and where it was, I think, a bit more straightforward to make a very strong investment case that this made a difference, that these have very critical impacts across different, different areas. But the, the, the crisis was, was clear that we, had st we have still a lot to go in terms of the care economy and family friendly policies on the informal sector, on migration, ch children on the move, on the, on the broader inclusive agenda, even including people and children with, with disabilities. The second big area, which is not linked to design, but we're asking governments to do a lot more with a very cool, with, with us, with us shorten or, or, or smaller fiscal space and in the midst of a recession, right? Um, so now it's, it's a question of not only being strong advocates that we need to protect spending, but also being very practical that we know the governments will have to make hard choices, how to support the, that these choices do not have a critical impact on SDG 1, on the most vulnerable, on the most excluded. No? What are the, 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 the viable options that we can put forward? How are we better engaged with the IFIs and also with broader partners such as the private sector, humanitarian donors that can broaden, if you want, the capacity of, of financing and the capacity to invest in, in, broader, in broader programs. Hard choices most of the time automatically lead to further exclusion. And I think we, we do have a role to play as a collective um, family, if I can say, to make sure that we have very strong case of why this has to be um, spent and protected. No? Um, I think one of the, the big um, goals of UNICEF is not just having a strong advocacy voice, but that that advocacy is very strongly backed up with numbers and a strong investment case. That is not just right because it's the right thing to do and because we are trying to fulfill children's right, but it's also what economically makes the most sense in terms of how we want to to move forward, no, and we've done, I think, very important assessments of how have been the, the different responses to previous crises, and we don't want to, if you want, uh, miss or, or duplicate the errors of the past. So really, the first sectors that are attacked, if you want, are the social sectors, all the ones that right now have been proven to be the most effective in responding to to crises. No, so. If I can say that we, we, we should be happy that social protection is the forefront, but not lose the opportunity to make sure that we push for further investments so that these systems can be, can be expanded. But also being realistic that we need to provide governments not just with a call, but also with very clear financing options for this to actually happen and be, and be developed further. Thanks. Thank you, Natalia. Absolutely, absolutely. The, the, the the evidence, we talked about that on, on Tuesday, how can we uh, gather evidence, how can we analyze it, how can we build on it, and, and how can we uh, shift the paradigm, maintain the momentum, you know, what, what actions can we take? So then, FAO has been, um, uh, has been doing some scenarios planning and, uh, and uh, looking at the impact of, the, of this uh, devastating crisis on, uh, on hunger, on, uh, on how you know, many more millions of people will, uh, will go hungry, or how many more millions of people will be undernourished, how uh, food supply chains have been disrupted and, and how they will need to be, uh, uh, to, to be strengthened and to be brought back to normal. So, um, I know that, that that's been some very, very, there's been some very, very interesting research that has come out from, uh, from FAO. Um, what do you see as the key challenges? Of course, I mean, the, the, the crisis has deepened and worsened a, a trend that unfortunately we'd already started seeing before the crisis where, with, a, with a slight reversal of, of the gains that we've made in, in achieving SDG 1 and, and in reducing the number of people living in hunger. So. Um, what is it that you see? What keeps you awake at night? I mean, Natalia does stay awake, she said. Is, is that the case with you as well? Yeah, no, thanks. And thanks again also for the invitation. I mean, I think, I think we all have the same sources of insomnia and, and nightmares at night. And I think really the, the gravity of the crisis is what really is, it's, it's scary. And I think 
the, I mean, you, you can cite the, the, the numbers around the increasing number of hungry or the increasing number of extreme poor. I mean, I think the, uh, I think, and perhaps we even, you know, we're waiting for a pandemic to happen, but I don't think anyone expected what the, the global impact would be, right? You know, and, and at first we started to be, a, you know, comparing it to the Great Recession 10 years ago. Now we're slowly comparing it to the Great Depression. And, and my feeling is it's going to get a lot worse and it's going to be, you know, in a way far worse to, than, than the Great Depression. And so um, uh, that's really what, what keeps me up at night. And I think, and it, it's, I mean, it's clearly compounded all the challenges we had before and is, is, creating, and is creating new ones. And I, and I think my biggest fear is that the leadership, our leadership is not up to the task uh, to addressing such an unprecedented, unexpected, you know, uh, situation. I hear I'm talking about national big leaders, you know, where clearly we've seen both good reactions and a lot of incompetence, but also the little leaders, let's say us, right? And each one of us has a very important role to play within our respective areas. And, um, and I often fear that we're not doing enough, we're not being innovative enough, we're not, you know, uh, uh, being audacious enough in terms of, of just getting beyond our same old, old messages, right? And, you know, believing things that perhaps before were unbelievable. And so, I mean, I, so for me, that's my, that, that's what really keeps me up at night is that, uh, that our response really isn't up to task. Our collective response isn't up to task. No? And I also think the, I mean, there, I mean, I think there has been a big focus on the, you know, the immediate humanitarian dealing with, you know, the immediate effects of the, of the crisis, you know, both the health and the socioeconomic effects. Um, and, uh, and my fear is that in terms of, uh, as we move from the temporary to the, to the recovery, um, that we don't address some of the big structural issues that were there before that have gotten much worse. We have the one thing COVID has done, it's really uh, clear, I mean, it's really exposed, you know, I think we all knew these inequalities existed, um, but it's really put them so that no one can ignore them. In every society, rich or poor, these, these inequalities have, have been much more uh, brought to the fore. And um, if we don't start addressing some of these structural issues as well, it's going to lead to a, a bleaker situation in, in the future. And I think some of the, you know, some of the real key inequalities that have been, you know, I mean, these, some of these have been highlighted, um, certainly in terms of health and health access and, and, and health insurance, certainly in terms of gender and women's role in the, in the double, triple burden they're bearing in this crisis, but really also the world of employment and kind of just how important formality is in employment. And I think, um, I think that's a, it's a big shift, particularly for us at FAO, where we deal, you know, we deal with the world, rural areas where most of the work is informal, right? And we always knew that, but I think the consequences are so clear now for everyone what the implications of that in, informality is, right? And social protection is one key response to this, but it's certainly not the only response, right? And it's something that needs to be combined with other, uh, with other approaches in order to, to deal with, you know, some of these, some of these structural issues. And again, as a number of you have mentioned, this is, a, I mean, it's a, it's a big disaster. Um, and these great disasters can lead to either big changes or they can lead to really bad outcomes in the future, right? Um, and there's some big agendas, which were, you know, which were kind of the key agendas, let's say global agendas around, let's say climate change, natural resources, diets, uh, you know, food systems, changing food systems. And there's, there is a real danger that there's gonna be a big, uh, uh, um, backtrack in terms of some of these big some of these big narratives and i think what this also exposes that really the this 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 kind of this vulnerability of the world of informality and and the world of of real systems is really it's, it's a significant vulnerability for how we get our food for how food systems happen and kind of the resilience of the global system around food and so i think this needs to be part of our approach and our argument is you know, social protection and other policies and, uh, and efforts towards uh, addressing this vulnerability of individuals and of households and, rural and communities, rural and urban, is really also about ma uh, making our food systems resilient and about, um, you know, obviously a more sustainable process of, of uh, development into the future. Thanks. Thanks, Ben. I, um, yes, what I'm picking up uh, from, from what you're saying is, uh, again, another recurrent theme, which is the erosion of the gains that, that we've made. Uh, we, we started off by, by talking about hunger, you know, the, the fight against hunger. Uh, but of course, you mentioned gender 
and I know that's uh, that's one thing that the ILO has picked up on as well in their research. I mean, the and you in your research, uh, FAO as well, uh, the impact on women is is still emerging, but it's much bigger than than I think we we initially thought. Uh, and we we see that everywhere. I mean, I I you know drive to work in the morning listening to the radio, and they were just talking about that. Uh, there's new um, data that has emerged in Italy about uh, women leaving work with them needing to look after their kids because uh, my kids were off school. So I think it's, that's, that's the thing about this crisis, that it's touched all our lives in, in, in very similar ways. But, but of course, it, it, COVID has, is not a big leveler. It isn't at all because uh, many people have, uh, have been harder hit. Uh, than uh, many countries have been harder hit by, by COVID than others. But Sarah, over to you. Now, uh, what uh, what have been the the, the key challenges? I, I presume there's a, there's a lot of overlap, perhaps, with what um, FAO has done, and I know that you work very closely together as well. But uh, uh, what are the, the key challenges, the, the key dangers that, that you see emerging from uh, from this this huge crisis? Yeah, so as you were saying at the beginning, Costanza, and by the way, thank you also for this opportunity. It's great to see uh, uh, respected friends and colleagues. And um, so as you were saying at the beginning, Costanza, there are some very particular things about the COVID crisis, including notably its scale and the extent to which it's kind of thrown people into, you know, who we don't normally think about as being vulnerable. Um, to poverty and food security and, and insecurity and malnutrition and so on into this sort of state of, of vulnerability. And what we've been seeing, this, this raises a lot of challenges and what we've been noting in WFP, for example, I can share, uh, I can share some of the main challenges that are coming up uh, through our work. You know, as we know, WFP does a lot of work with countries on analysis and vulnerability analysis and profiling and, and monitoring and so on. And I think as also, as we all know, there are a lot of new needs emerging or needs that people are in, that weren't necessarily previously covered by existing um, social protection measures. Um, in many countries, for example, entirely new urban programs have had to, been, to, have had to be designed. Uh, as Ben was just discussing, you know, the needs of informal uh, workers are coming out very, very strongly in a lot of our analyses and, and monitoring. Um, the, the needs of job holders or people who, who previously uh, held jobs, new needs are emerging everywhere, um, sometimes uh, encompassing vast numbers of, of people who may not have previously um, certainly been included in social assistance. Uh, programs, especially in places where these were just being developed. And of course, this raises a lot of very difficult um, political choices about how to respond to larger than usual and multiplying needs and where to put, uh, where to put scarce resources. And some of the particular challenges um, that we see countries struggling with are, you know, about, specifically about where to put money and how, how much focus to put on um, responding to people who are affected by COVID in COVID specifically, as opposed to addressing pre-existing vulnerabilities, um, which in many or probably most cases were insufficiently addressed uh, even when COVID came along. And of course, as we know, vulnerabilities, they don't sit in nice little compartments. They're multiple and they're overlapping and, and they compound. Um, and you know, we also see places where programs might have been in place that were um, focused on targeting kind of maybe the bottom 10% or the bottom 20% of people, sort of the poorest of the poor. And you know, needs are far beyond that now. So in some cases, you know, countries really are being challenged and we along with them as their partners to take a second look at what our objectives, uh, you know, what our objectives are. Are, and where, where does the money need to go? You know, do we continue to focus on programs that, that protect a certainly vulnerable but small proportion of the population? Or do we need to layer in there um, much more investment in programs that uh, prevent vulnerability and that build resilience in the longer term? So this is kind of the overall big challenge that I think we're all very aware of is just this need to make some very difficult policy choices about where to put money. 
and hopefully there will be opportunities to kind of grow, grow fiscal and maintain a grown fiscal space for this, but it's likely also that some difficult choices are going to need to be made. Uh, if we do more of something, we may have to cut something else. So what are those choices going to be? Um, in addition, of course, Ben, as you were just talking about, the depth and breadth of hunger has increased. And we believe very much, and it's our experience, that in all of these social protection uh, programs and responses, both now, immediate, short term, but also longer term, that food security and nutrition needs to be needs to be considered explicitly, explicitly right at problem, you know, at the diagnosis and program design stage. So that's a that's another um, probably not a COVID specific challenge, but yet again, one that's uh, really accentuated and brought into relief by COVID. Um, and the third thing I think that, uh, that worries uh, me and probably many people uh, is just the, the fact that the, you know, the other crises that always happen, they haven't stopped. So we're very focused on COVID right now for all, all good reasons, but other things are happening and these crises are compounding uh, an already very difficult situation. We have, of course, you know, our climate colleagues who are saying, hey, you know, did you forget, <laughs> don't forget that we had a climate emergency, you know, even before 2020, and uh, we can't kind of keep get our, our, we have to keep our eye on the ball on that one. We still have conflict, and probably I'm super aware of this because WFP is a little bit of a, you know, a sort of a, 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 a crisis focused organization as well. Um, we've got conflict, and migration and hurricanes are still happening and earthquakes are still happening and lean season is still happening and we even have locusts for heaven's sake um, I mean thanks a lot world for that one so these are the kinds of things that really uh, do keep me up at night and then above all kind of overarching is just how do we how are we going to deal with the economic um, sort of fallout about the uh, fallout of all of this in a way um, that not only builds back, but actually, you know, does bring about more resilient and fair societies. And that seems to me to be a really laudable vision, but it's also a very sort of tall, it's also a very tall order. So the roadmap to that, uh, I'm glad we're all thinking about it. Thank you for that, Sarah. I. Um... Yes, I think what you're saying is absolutely right. I mean, COVID has compounded other crises. It's, it's accelerated trends, as I said earlier, but it's created new, new needs. We've heard that a lot uh, over the, the course of this, uh, of this learning journey on, on uh, e-coaching, on social protection. And uh, um, Stephen Kidd still was telling us that we are all vulnerable. That's, that's a very important lesson. And as you were saying, uh, it's not just about focusing on uh, on the, the bottom 10 percent uh, but it's it's about trying to to focus on everybody because we, we've all been vulnerable in, in different ways either health-wise socially mentally uh, physically economically uh, politically because of course this has created a lot of political tensions and will continue to do so so the lay of the land has completely Changed, and I and I really agree with what you were saying about uh, about needing to make very difficult choices, not just governments, but also our agencies. So, um, and that's that brings me neatly onto the, the next question that I wanted to ask you. Um, of course, the, the challenges are are um, very complex. We, we've talked about you know other crises still continuing and and all sorts of, of uh, socio-economic and political challenges uh, that, that have hit us sideways but how can we you're all working on it in, in similar and different ways and from different angles we're all part of the UN system so how can we work together I know that uh, you know that, uh, there was a big drive at the, at the beginning of the crisis we have documents that we can go back to uh, an agenda that was drawn up uh, the SDGs agenda that was there before but how can we practically you you know, let's let's you know stop thinking about the rhetoric and really think uh, in in tangible terms, in concrete terms. You know, what? How can we work together in order, given that we're focusing on social protection? I do agree with Ben that social protection is not the silver bullet; it's not the only answer, and and we need to think about 
that in, in broader terms, but how can we work together to ensure that this goodwill, you know, this, this momentum that has been created, just as Sarah was saying towards the end, you know, it, it sort of turns the right way and it doesn't either fizzle out or makes us turn inward. And, uh, and, and so not uh, motivate and inspire this, this missing international solidarity. What, what can we do about it? Um, maybe I'll start with Ben now. Um, sorry to put you on the spot, but uh, uh, what are your thoughts on that? I, I really like what you were saying about the, the inadequacy of the, of the response. I think it was, you know, and thank you all for being so candid. I think that's, that's uh, and frank and open. I think that is exactly what we want to get from you because you're such thought leaders on social protection. We really need a, a fair bit of soul searching, I think, today. So. Yeah, no, thanks. Well, first I wanted to say, I mean, I think I just, I, I disagree with a bit this idea that we're all suffering from company. We're obviously all suffering, but I think, uh, I mean, this has not been the great equalizer, this, <laughs> this pandemic. If anything, it's been the great unequalizer and it showed how unequal we are and show how differential the impact is. And so, uh, I mean, it's true we all have different, we all have, we're all vulnerable to one way or another, but I mean, it's, it's not equal vulnerability. And so I, I, I I kind of disagree with that. And I think, I think it's important because there's going to be a lot of money is going to be spent on dealing, despite all the financial restrictions, there's going to be a lot of public money spent over the next few years to address the impact. And uh, th that, I mean, and that's where the big fight is going to be to make sure that that money is spent where it's needed most uh, and that it goes to those who are most vulnerable and those who need it, right? And, um, and to be honest, the, if, if we take a neutral approach along those lines, it's going to go to the better off, it's going to go to urban areas, it's going to go to those who have the biggest political voice, and it'll be those who are traditionally excluded are going to be excluded as well, right? And so uh, I really think it's, it's really fundamental to understand the, the political nature of this pandemic and the political nature of the response and the implications of that for the, for the recovery, right? Because we don't advocate, we don't talk about that now uh, it's not going to be, it's going to lead to more inequality and a worse situation in the future, right? And so, so I would, I would push back a little on that. Now, and now more directly to the question, I think the, I mean, I think all of us need to bring our particular focus and our, constitu our constituency, right? In the case of FAO, we're very much focused on rural areas. We focus on food and agriculture, broadly, broadly writ, very much from a more development perspective, a longer term perspective, uh, you know, broadly speaking, similar to WFP, which focuses, uh, tends to focus more on, on the humanitarian side, but that's kind of our world, right? And I think um, that's where, and we have our constituency, which is the Minister of Agriculture, and other, in some cases, you know, other ministries, environment, what have you, which are our main uh, partners. And, and those are the ones we need to work with in terms of um, uh, bringing forth this message of why social protection is so important for food systems, why social protection is so important for economic recovery in agriculture in the agricultural sector in rural areas of, 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 of or in even urban areas in, in developing countries, right? And so I think and each one of us has our own uh, constituencies internationally, regionally, and particularly at the country level. And I think that's where we need to bring to bear our particular strength and our particular um, entry points. And clearly we need to, um, uh, you know, band together in a much better way at country level. Again, we need to get rid of this. I mean, there is a process of UN reform going on at the country level, you know, but be honest, it's still that we work as one is, is, is a myth, right? And so, I mean, we clearly, in some cases, we work better in other cases. I mean, in some cases we're trying, in other cases, there's still a lot of competition. And so if we can't get over that kind of basic problem at country level, then it's, it's, it's gonna be very difficult, right? And so, um, I think uh, uh, each of the, the UN family needs to kind of look honestly at itself and be willing to contribute to, to a broader process without fighting for space and competition and resources, which to me is just, just disgusting in a, in a crisis like this, right? Um, and again, we need to work together to make sure that social protection is part of a long-term vision and response. Um, and again, we've, again we, I mean, we've, we've been focusing on the immediate, now it's time to look to the long term, to the recovery, and linking this to the longer term development, whether it's economic, whether it's social, and whether it's the, the strengthening of the, of the food system. Thanks. 
Thank you, Ben, for this wake up call. I think uh, it's uh, definitely, and I really appreciate, as I said, you being so, speaking so candidly and, and openly. I think this is the time to do so. Um, so, um, Natalia, um, what about, uh, what, what, what do you think? How can, how can we do what, you know, what Ben has said? It, it now is the time to, you know, work as well, you know, step aside from the rhetoric and, and really do it, you know, roll your sleeves off and do it. Cause that's the, this is the time. If we don't do it now, I don't know when, uh, we'll do it. And, um, how, how can we do that? How can we, how can we come together? How can we complement each other? Uh, you know, talking to ministries, Ben was saying, you know, there, we all have our constituencies. We all have our different interlocutors. How can we coordinate that better? How can we, how can we do that? Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, and I mean, I, I agree that if a pandemic doesn't create the incentives for that coordination, I don't know what will. So <laughs> I think at least in this first hour, it's clear that we are at least agreeing on the broader objectives, not systems, long term solution, pro focus on preparedness also, the importance of financing, integrating social protection in the broader processes that we work on. If it's social development, if it's food security, if it's agriculture, that it's, part, it's an integral part of a broader process. And also the commitment to e inclusion and equality. You know? So at least we agree on general cases around that. I, I do agree on trying to work through our own constituencies, constituencies, but also the specific areas that we, I don't know if it's added value, but that we have that trust relationship with our different government partners that we know that we can contribute. You know? If it's children, if it's um, the care economy, if it's the gender elements, because there's a lot to be done. There's a lot of, of gaps that need to be addressed. And, and it's, there's, there's a lot of work to do to be evenly, I think, divided and, 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 and supported by different, by different elements. Um, one thing that I think is missing from this discussion, and I think that I feel sometimes that we're talking among ourselves and we need to a little bit broaden the partnership. No, so this is the time for, for innovation, for thinking outside the box, to bringing what what can the private sector bring, what can climate financing bring, um, what are the different parts of what is civil society and community leaders can bring, and the things that they're already doing. When there's no government in place, you see a lot of innovation that's coming from community-based organization, from um, adolescents, from different groups that are already putting forth ideas to be able to create a resilient community. Now we need to, I think. Um, raise up a bit more of those voices and broader a little bit our, our, our agenda and our, and our partnership. Um, I think we are working more or less okay in terms of the UN system, but I, I, I think it's not enough for, the, for the, the kind of of challenges that we're putting forth in terms of the pandemic. The informality sector cannot be only worked out with government or state counterparts. It needs to bring businesses, it needs to bring the private sector, it needs to bring, you know, the constituencies of the ILO, you know, the other, the other parts of the, of the equation that will make a change in terms of proper family, family friendly policies or care economy or, or maternity leaves and unemployment benefits. And it has to be a broad, more broader discussion that also opens up and broaden, I think, the, the financing options for this to be a, a proper, I think, response. No? So, Without repeating what, what Ben said, I think that will be the added thing that I will put on the table, that I think we need to very explicitly broaden with whom we're speaking and, and who, is, who is our audience, if you want, um, to try to, to make that change in thought in terms of, of, our, of our planning moving forward. Thanks. You're muted, Constanza. You're muted. Constanza, you're muted. <laughs> there you go. You're right. I was just, I was just saying. I think that's, um, uh, yeah, definitely a, a good push to, uh, to you know, think outside the box, as, as, as they say, uh, starting from a common agenda, which is, which is a good start, as you were saying. But uh, you know, are we just? talking to ourselves, which is, uh, which is uh, a good point. I wonder if I was going to move to Sarah, but I wonder if Shara would like to come in, because of course you were um, uh, referring to social dialogue and talking to the private sector and, and you know, we've, um, Shara brought in 
referred to the issues um, with, the, with the labor market, of course, uh, the, the COVID has been incredibly disruptive of that. And I know that uh, uh, the ILO is talking about a jobs rich recovery. So with, with um, social dialogue being at the center of that. So Shara, do you have any thoughts perhaps on that before we move on to Sarah? Yeah, um, thank you. This has been a really interesting discussion to listen to. Um, and I want to, I want to agree with Ben. I, I, I'm sure many of us do. I totally get the point that by all means, this crisis has not been the great equalizer. I don't know whoever thought it was. If anything, I think it has exposed um, the very structural inequalities that we had. You know, I was living in Manhattan when everyone was saying, oh my God, you know, the New York, you know, that's terrible. Actually, Manhattan was not too bad. A lot of that crisis was happening, you know, in Bronx, uh, in Queens, you know, it was the highly class race um, sort of uh, determined, you know, where and who was being hit. Um, and, you know, yes, of course, we have, you know, princes and presidents who have had the virus like, you know, everyone else. But my God, you know, that's where the equality ends and how people cope with the crisis, you know, whether they have access to um, an income, whether they have a decent social protection that can kick in, whether they can have internet so that their children can get you know, some form of education while schools are closed, you know, all of these things we know have made a huge difference. And, and we're not, we're not all in the same boat, <laughs> definitely not. So I want to agree with that. But uh, on the other hand, to say that we mo moving on from that and making sure that the resources that are allocated are spent well and don't go to the rich, I totally agree with Ben on that. But I think we have to be careful how, uh, you know, how we think about the next steps. Because in, you know, for some people then that would lead then to this idea that we can have this perfect targeting and make sure that the resources are spent on those who are really, really needy. And I think, you know, I, I'm not suggesting that this is what Ben would suggest, but I'm just saying some people might read into that, you know, the need for this sort of perfect targeting, which I think many of us in this round table and many people who are listening to us would know all the problems with targeting. I mean, so much has been written about that, that I don't, I don't need to spend your time and my time going over it, but, you know, we know all the exclusions. We know that as, um, uh, you know, Natalia and others were saying as well, you know, this crisis has exposed the fact that it's not just the bottom, whatever, 10% that is hit, you know, it's people go in and out of poverty, you know, it's not, it's not such a static thing. And, um, and it is that missing middle that doesn't have the social assistance and is not always included in the social insurance systems either, that is left kind of with nothing to go by. So, so I think we need to really be thinking as everyone else was saying as well. So I'm not saying anything new here, but in terms of building, you know, our kind of sh shifting towards greater universalism, inclusion and having systems that bring in uh, everyone as a way of also making it uh, fiscally sustainable, you know? I mean, there's gonna be a limit to how much we can get through the social assistance uh, budgets and 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 have these somewhat sometimes fragmented um, programs which have now mushroomed as a result of the crisis and they've done their job and it's good but as we move forward I think we need to really be thinking about how we can bring, build and strengthen the system and here I think the point that everyone was referring to about labor and informality of labor is really the linchpin um, you know, children are affected if their parents are in the informal economy. Um, access to food is determined by how much income you have and whether or not people who are, um, you know, in lockdown or done, done out of jobs can have access to some kind of um, benefit and income in the interim until, you know, the economy recovers is obviously going to make a difference for all the different constituencies and all the different issues that uh, we as agencies kind of deal with. So I think, um, I think the, the issues around labor are very important. And with this crisis, what we've seen is that really social protection is something that also I think employers recognize as being something very important because it also allows kind of business continuity. So um, I think there is a potential for a real kind of social dialogue uh, around the importance of it and then moving to the next step and saying, okay, and who's gonna pay for it, right? Uh, this is something, it's a public good, it's something from which we all kind of benefit, workers benefit, their children, you know, so it has all these um, positive uh, and, uh, multiplier effects. 
in society, in the economy. And then it's a question, how are we going to finance it? And I think that's where we really need to be talking about also employers and private sector, you know, corporations, their responsibilities for making their contributions uh, through a social insurance system. Of course, this is not something that's going to happen overnight. In countries where we have 90% informality, you know, 95% uh, of poor people in the rural economy being informal and the rural economy being very big, you know, this, these are the realities we're dealing with. But I think it's a, you know, we need that long-term vision to gradually get us there. Start with workers, informal workers that are easier to formalize, you know, those that are wage workers maybe and have a recognized employer. And then, you know, obviously with the self-employed uh, and on-account workers, it's a much more challenging prospect. But I think for a sustainable system of social protection, we cannot entirely rely on taxes, uh, on general revenue from government, nor is it very healthy to bank on you know, ODA. So we really need to think about how to mobilize those resources and, and use the goodwill of employers and the private sector now that there is recognition of the importance of social protection, not only for well-being and for social issues, but also as an important factor to allow business continuity, to allow corp you know, um, employers to be able to uh, continue their operations uh, beyond the crisis. I think you know, that would be a really important point to bring on board. And then I think for us as the UN family, you know, we talk to each other a lot and we work very closely because, you know, we're very interested in universal child benefits. So we work with UNICEF on that. So, I mean, that just goes without saying. Uh, but also I think, you know, with the IFIs, you know, we may have some differences, but, but we're talking. And, and I think that conversation is really important. And we have mechanisms like SPIACV that allows a level of um, coordination um, it could be str stronger, you know, I know that there's some concerns about SPIACB having been more of a global thing and not happening at the national level, but there are other mechanisms at the national level that also make that happen. So I think we need to make much more use of what we have and of some of the commonalities that we have and we can speak to each other. Uh, I was very encouraged when, you know, the ba World Bank said, yeah, there are problems with targeting in, in this current context and we need to go for extending benefits and, and, and not having conditionalities and targeting. I think that's great. That's we're moving forward and there is a conversation going and we need to continue that conversation, particularly, you know, also with um, IMF that now recognizes the importance of social spending. So, you know, yes, let's have a conversation about social spending and how do we uh, make sure that that space for social spending is kept and sustained over time um, and how do we bring in resources uh, through uh, more progressive tax systems but also through um, social security contributions. Um, I think that that would be a very constructive engagement. Thank you Shara and over to Sarah now. I'm sorry to always leave you last. I will, I will uh, speak to you first next time. Um, so what's, I think you raised, a, you know, as I said, a lot of interesting points about, about needing to, to make hard decisions. And, and how does that apply to you know, working together, to, uh, to the idea that if you have to make a hard decision, you might be uh, aiming to strengthen the complementarity, perhaps with somebody else who might be working on another area that maybe you've had to drop, or you know, how the, 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 we're greater than the sum of our parts, as we say. So how does that, how would that apply to, uh, to your work, in your view? Well, I think there are some very practical things we can do. And I think it's also important to recognize that we have frameworks in place to support coherent work. At least we have the frameworks in place with the Social Protection Floor Initiative and USP 2030 in particular. To, that articulate a, a common vision um, within which we can, you know, collectively, to which we can we can contribute. And I think having an agreed vision, it doesn't necessarily it doesn't answer the question about how we're going to get there. But I just want to say I think having that vision is a really good start. And what we were working towards is still relevant. <laughs> Um, that vision, I don't think, has changed. If anything, the, everything that's happening with COVID is just highlighting how relevant uh, how relevant it all it, 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 it all was. And by it all, I mean the the progress of realization of universal social protection and the and the progress um, that needed to be made already 
um, to increasing routine, regular, uh, regular social protection. So having those frameworks in place, I think, is already a really, really important step. Um, two, what can we do, though, to keep this momentum? Um, uh, you know, as I just said, what, we were, what we've always been working towards is still uh, relevant. And although COVID is unprecedented from many points of view, if we look at it as unprecedented and extreme from many points of view, if we look at it from the point of view of an affected you know, individual, it may not be so different from many other shocks. Breadwinners die, livelihoods uh, are lost, um, different things happen at the same time uh, to families. So I think what's important for us to do and what we actually can practically do even as we you know, say everything we have to say about how urgent and extreme COVID is, is to make sure that we're still kind of talking about it or keeping it as part of a narrative that is also propelling a long-term view of social protection rather than as a one-off, rather than as a one-off event. So I think that's one thing that we can just be conscious, uh, conscious of and, and consciously uh, harness to help keep the momentum. Another practical thing I think that we can do is just uh, try to do smart things. And you know, all of us are guilty of having um, sort of preferences. All of us, all of our agencies um, are guilty of having kind of things that we think are the solution. Um, and sometimes I think we don't think enough about, uh, we don't think enough about the problem before coming to propose our specific solutions. And we're quite good at being able to say why you know, the programs that we support or the groups that we represent or you know, why the programs that we support are really good investments and they're really important. But we're not always so good at, 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 at sitting with a country and kind of looking at, at recognizing the difficulty, uh, the reality of difficult choices and trade-offs at sitting with a country and kind of saying, okay, let's look at options. So I think one really practical and feasible thing that we could do together is really focus on a collective definition of the problem. And even now, um, sitting down and looking at, you know, what impact is COVID having you know, in this country, who is it affecting? You know, what are the options? And help a government, you know, look at what option, what the priorities might be. You know, in our immediate interest area, but also more broadly. Um, in fact, that's the point. And then, and then focus on on, on helping to look at, uh, helping to elaborate options and their implications. Um, maybe rather than coming too readily with what we think the answer might be. So that's another thing, and. Something else that, that occurs to me is, is about what we can do. Well, it's maybe not what we can do to do smart things well, but it's about what governments are actually able, what governments now can demand from us. So, you know, if we focus on the government experience of our support as individual, as, as you and agencies, um, we see that there are many actors now, you know, really, really anxious to support governments to scale and improve their social protection. Many agencies and actors want to be engaged. Um, and then I think, as you said, the reality is, is that often it's, it's, it's competitive and there's no excuse for it, um, but it is. But I think what happens now, precisely because it is competitive and because there's so, there are so many agencies you know, ready to offer and ready to, ready to partner, governments get to be more demanding about how, what, in what ways you want us all to work. And I think governments get to be more demanding about asking us for a collective value proposition and about demanding that we work in ways that reduce your transaction costs and don't actually, uh, don't actually increase them. So that's uh, some uh, intentionally <laughs> provocative. You responded well to Frank earlier. So I went ahead and was Frank on, on, on that just for the sake of a good conversation. But I think those are some practical things that, that, that we should be conscious of and, and we can try to do. No, but thank you, Sarah. I really, um, I really, like, uh, I really like what you're saying. I mean, we, we, we know that's the reality on, on the ground. So uh, uh, definitely the idea of a collective value proposition, a collective definition of the problem, you know, sitting, uh, looking at the evidence again, it goes back to that, you know, it goes back to uh, uh, trying to, uh, define what, what the problem is before, rather than going in with prepackaged uh, solutions. 
definitely, and we're according to our preferences. Absolutely. There, um, if I can just follow up um, from that before we move on to the next question, there was one of the comments in the Q and A um, talked about uh, engaging with communities at the grassroots, so social dialogue, not just you know talking to employers. And Natalia mentioned the private sector. You mentioned states and governments, of course. But you know, what about the people? What about the people that we're you know supposed to be uh, working with, alongside, listening to? Uh, how are, are we going to do things differently from now on? Or um, you know, definitely they should be part part of the um, of this uh, defining the problem uh, stage, I guess. Well, anybody wants to jump in? Well, I think there are different ways of doing that, and, and Shara is probably the expert on social dialogue. Um, but just in a nutshell, I think that's part of what I mean by let's step back from positions, from preferences and, and, and positions and ask the questions. Thank you. I like that. Ben? No, I mean, I... I mean, I mean, it, 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 I'm trying to think how to respond I to Sarah's you statement. Off guard. <laughs> you caught me off guard. In the sense that, uh, I mean, I think, I mean, ultimately that's what we want, right? But sometimes I just despair that we could actually do that. Even among our little community, the UN come with one value proposition. But I would agree that that's kind of the, I mean, maybe that's the thinking outside the box that we can actually come to agreement and work as one um, in that one sense. I mean, I, I also think it's important, I think we need to focus on, again, it's uh, getting uh, social protection to scale. And I just want to go back to the comment that, uh, um, that uh, Shada made in her initial around the role of the state and how important that is and the importance of institutions, of capacity, um, the politics, et cetera. But also I think, again, as you had alluded to, and there's also a question around, this is the role of civil society, which, um, clearly, I don't think we've, uh, um, in terms of our, both our adv advocacy, in terms of thinking about how we implement these programs and how we promote these programs, um, a much more innovative role for civil society and organized civil society, whether they be producer organizations, whether they be community organizations, what have you, right? And maybe there's different models instead of just the old traditional model, um, let's say, of cash transfers, right? And I agree also very much with what... Um, um, Shada was saying in terms of the need to move beyond social assistance. And, I, and really, for me, has been this fundamental issue of the informality of, of labor. And so I think part of the self-criticism is also just, and again, I, I agree with Sarah in terms of we think about our own proposals, we're kind of locked into this rut. Um, and just the importance of uh, thinking outside the box, but I mean, actually realizing that stuff that you can't imagine being accepted actually gets accepted. I mean, I mean, I... I mean, when I look at the United States in the past four years, things that are being said politically, I, I could never imagine that they, would, that they would be said, right? Or some of the stuff that's just the, the, the happenings over the past six months there in another country, you just can't expect, you, you wouldn't expect that some policies are being put forth that are gaining traction that you'd never expect before, right? And so um, I think uh, that just pushes us to be much more, uh, um, uh, you know, innovative and, and just really think beyond as to, as to what we can do. One thing, just one concrete thing that, for example, that FAO has been asked to do, particularly in Latin America is, and particularly again in the ag sector, is helping, and this, is, this, this goes along with some of the comments that have been made, is helping think, okay, what, is the next, what are the next policy steps in terms of reactivating agriculture and value change in food systems, right? And so our perspective from, from let's, from, is to bring in, obviously, so one could do a very traditional analysis, but here we're very much trying to bring in the social dimension, the importance of social protection, and how it needs to be thought of as a broad policy response, and not just a response that's around agriculture, right, or, or value chains, right? Um, and so I think this is a, just, and now I think there, there probably is a lot more traction because everyone in the, most of the ministries of agriculture now know what we're talking about, perhaps, because it's, it's, it's something which is on everyone's, um, on everyone's mind. And then finally, again, I, I also very, agree very much with, with uh, Shot in terms of uh, around, there's no, there's no such thing as perfect targeting. I think my, I mean, I very much believe in universality and the importance of universal um, policies. But for me, universality is also inherently unequal unless you specifically look at the, the constraints to universality. And so 
And whether it's marginalized communities, whether it's rural areas, whether it's all the demand side constraints, if you don't uh, look at that explicitly, then it's going to lead to inequality in a universal policy. And so, and I think that's what's so fundamental about this recovery policies is that unless you explicitly address inequalities, uh, you're going to create more, basically. Thanks. Thank you, Ben. Natalia, I think you, you were talking about um, uh, going beyond our comfort zone in terms of, you know, thinking uh, about other stakeholders, other interlocutors that, that perhaps go beyond our, uh, the usual ministries or, or the usual people that we speak to. Of course, UNICEF engages a lot with, with children themselves, where you mentioned adolescents. And, and I think I, I come from the NGO world. I'm new in the UN world, but I know that NGOs have been deeply shaken, I believe, and, and I believe so have the UN agencies, by, by the, the resurgence of, of people-led development, or particularly talking about adolescents, if we think about climate change and that whole movement, which has now gone slightly dormant, of course, because everything is, is about COVID, but it hasn't gone away, as, as everybody on the panel has said. And, and more recently, I mean, we don't need to look very far, uh, you know, the Black Lives Matter uh, movement, uh, again, you know, very much grassroots led, people led, it's, it's people standing up and, and trying to redefine the agenda uh, in as much as they can, of course, within the circumstances. So do we think that, that COVID might, um, in the post-COVID era, which we don't know when that will be, I mean, because of course uh, some countries are, uh, are still in the thrall of the, of the virus, others have, have, are, are having some respite, like my own country, Italy, which was one of the first ones hit. And actually, interestingly, what you were saying about um, Manhattanshire, about um, uh, COVID hit in the Bronx more than Manhattan, it's, it's interesting because in my country instead it was the rich north the richest regions in, in Italy that were completely devastated by, by the virus. So again, I totally agree COVID is not an equalizer, it isn't at all. Um, uh, and even geographically, it's, it's, uh, it's hit differently in different regions, different countries, different, different groups and everything. But going back to our common agenda and, and trying to really push ourselves beyond the boundaries i think we're doing that we're edging forward i mean we are edging towards the road to recovery at different speeds and it's it's a long and winding road it's it's not straightforward but i think sarah told us about you know what we could do differently i really like what you were saying about stepping away from our roles from our preferences i think that's a that's a good starting point so we have a common agenda. What is it that we're going to do differently? What, what, what actions can we take to, to, to um, try to edge towards this paradigm shift? I think what you were saying, Ben, about uh, universalism also having its limits is, is very interesting. But um, what, what will we do your, What will you do differently starting from? tomorrow. What are you already doing differently? Um, Sarah mentioned um, having to reignite some urban pr uh, uh, programs perhaps or, or in areas that were, were perhaps had been forgotten uh, previously uh, or not. What are we going to do differently? What are we, uh, as, as we get on the road to recovery, we know what the challenges are or some of them, you know, have been mentioned today. Sarah, why don't you go first? You always, uh, I've, I've always got you to go last, so uh, you can be first for once. <laughs> okay, that's okay. I'm used to going last. That's uh, what happens when you have an organization that starts with W, and people usually go in alphabetical order, so it's fine. I'm, I'm actually just thinking about how to answer your question. So you're saying, what is it that we can do? Uh, what is it that we could do differently? Okay, so I mentioned a couple of things just in my last answer that, um, I mean, personally, I'm very committed to doing, uh, doing differently. Um, so I guess uh, to complement that, maybe it's a matter of thinking about how can um, you know, we as organizations help to um, capitalize on lessons that have been learned from this COVID response and from other large scale 
um, emergency responses. So I'm just kind of thinking about that. And I guess um, maybe three things come to mind. Um, one is, uh, well, probably, hopefully this isn't doing something too differently. But in terms of capitalizing on a lesson, there's been, you know, the lesson has been um, that governments are absolutely crucial. And if I think about it from a WFP, you know, organizational point of view, you know, WFP is an organization that's very, very good at like doing uh, stuff itself. And in fact, in 2020 is looking at reaching an unprecedented in history sort of number of beneficiaries. And that's great. I mean, that's really, really important when we're talking about, you know, 130 million beneficiaries. These are, these are important numbers, but it's actually supporting countries to scale up and maintain coverage and adequacy and quality of their own programs. That's actually the key to this not only this being kind of responding to the longer term impact of COVID, but also helping countries, you know, pursue and, and, and achieve the social protection goals that they had laid out for themselves uh, before we'd ever, in, in those nice times, before we'd ever actually uh, heard of COVID. So this, this kind of realization um, that COVID has put on us, uh, or let's just say kind of brought into, is highlighted for us again, that the scale of the need dwarfs the scale of what even, of, you know, what, what we can ourselves do. And by the way, the scale of what governments are already doing to help their own vulnerable people. This just forces uh, a completely do, new, new perspective. And it's one I'm, I'm happy to say like on the WFP side has been really, really embraced to kind of continue and protect uh, the doing, promote the doing, but also to really, really focus in a serious and more systematic way on um, how we're strengthening in the doing, how we're strengthening um, the national systems and what we can, you know, how we can beyond that actually help countries to, um, to, to develop and implement their own COVID responses independent of any kind of operational role for WFP. So I think that's one really, again, a, a lesson that's been learned and something that we're really um, trying to do trying to do differently. Um, yeah, I, okay, so another lesson is um, that being prepared makes response a lot easier. Preparedness makes things a lot easier. And again, this isn't just a COVID uh, lesson, but I think um, in the discussion, in the webinar that you had on Tuesday, it came out that someone made the comment, one of your panelists made the comment, that a lot of the COVID responses now are actually sort of symptoms of the fact that there was inadequate social protection, uh, inadequate social protection to begin with. And had we, you know, sort of been more prepared on that front, um, maybe the response would have been easier. And it's the same thing if we think about it from an emergency response, uh, sort of an emergency response um, uh, point of view and being prepared sort of not just with the rhetoric, but with the actual kind of nuts and bolts of that can make a big, big, uh, you know, difference. And I, I, could, I could give examples of that if, if you want from, 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 WFP's, ex, from WFP's experience, um, but I'll, I'll, I'll wait and see if you want me to do that. But um, that's, that's, that's a, big, a big lesson and something that we could do differently. And I think focusing on, um, focusing, uh, it, it's not very good for it. It's not very easy for our system. We like to, the humanitarian system likes to respond once things have already happened. And it's sort of notoriously challenging to do kind of the preparedness and the resilience in advance, no matter how many good economic and other arguments there are for doing it. Um, but once again, we're reminded that that's, uh, that, that's do it. Um, let me just stop there. I might have something else to add. So, Mick and I can reserve the, op of the, the option of coming back on a third of point. Of course, of Thank course. You. We still have some time, so don't worry. Um, um, let's move to Natalia, perhaps. Natalia, you've been uh, there's there's been some um, uh, some questions to you as well in terms of you mentioned the private sector. So uh, uh, people are asking, you know, how how would you do that? How would you talk to the private sector? Uh, how would you uh, engage with them? So perhaps you can also maybe touch on that when you uh, uh, when you come back to me now. But um, 
So what, what would you say have been the key lessons from, from your point of view and, and how will those lead you to do things differently going, uh, going forward? It might be things that you've touched on already, but... Uh... Yeah, I'm trying, sorry, trying not to, to repeat <laughs> um, also the points, although I, I think I'm, we're, it's good that we're sort of all in agreement on, at least on the broad, <laughs> on the broad issues. Um, I mean, for me, the first thing is to acknowledge that despite issues and despite a lot of the multiple crises that were already happening, many governments did step up you know, and they, do, they did take the responsibility to expand programs to really put social protection at the center stage. We know that it's not perfect. We know that there are still a lot of gaps and, it's, and we, could, we should not be um, silent. We need to be vigilant to make sure that those initial investments are taken further, but at least there was a political prioritization. And I think that's not automatic and should not be taken lightly. I mean, for many years in both the organizations that I work with, the, the need to constantly be convinced in government that social protection is important, that it's on a handout, that it doesn't create dependency, it's, it's a constant. So the fact that this has to some extent changed um, as a result of, hopefully as a result of this pandemic, I think it's something that we need to acknowledge and also take advantage of that pri pri prioritization um, to see how we can move the agenda a bit, a bit forward. No? Second is that the majority, not all, but the majority of these responses happened by using existing systems and existing national systems, systems that were not perfect, that it still had issues around targeting and, and coverage. But it showed that investing in making national systems risk inform versus going separately did pay off, that we still have a, a um, in many contexts, we, we still need to go by ourselves and we need needs to go to you know, uh, address some of the immediate needs. But there is a very strong inve investment case in prevention, but also in building the different elements of a system that is able to respond immediately and effectively. No? Um, and this is something that we take in UNICEF very close at heart. You know, that, and, it's not easy, and it's not an easy investment case to be made no? because systems are slower, there's a perception that governments, you know, they're slower, they're not effective enough, and it's always easier to go with our own machinery. And I think with all its limitations, the, 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 the current response did show that those countries that were able to respond, those were, were the countries that had something in place. Um, I think that it's also the, the um, as I think, and everybody has mentioned this, that it's, that it was a, um, it, it showed that we cannot be just complacent with having one single response that will able to change the whole dynamic. No, that we have different groups that have been affected even more. And some are more straightforward to tackle. Others have a very strong political dimension. I'm talking about migrants. I'm talking about displaced populations. I'm talking about populations that we know from a rights perspective need to be involved, but it's not always easy to engage with governments that still need to provide minimum coverage to their own citizens while having a very strong influx of displaced population. And, it, and this is a discussion that I think most of us here in the panel have put forth in many occasions, but we still have a very big, I think, um, road to, to play. No? Or the broader e exclusion issues, disability, gender and others were, are still there, are still recognized as important, but I don't think we've been able to make a change and really make a stronger case why it's important to invest in inclusion. No, and, and I go again, it's not just because it's the right thing to do, but it makes economic sense. Um, when I mentioned about broadening the agenda and broadening the partners, I was, I was thinking about in the UN, we have a lot of skills, but sometimes we need also to be able to bring together those agents that are innovating because they need to. So in many contexts, and I, a lot of the experience that I was able to gather in, in FAO, for instance, on understanding where the government was not there, the communities were there trying to define the ways to provide some sort of social protection. Um, and in the same way, I've, I've been seeing in, in the work in UNICEF, a lot of youth and community leaders that are there trying to provide some sort of response to their peers when the state is not there. We need to elevate that innovation. We need to take advantage to you know, assess them, make sure that we can take advantage of that work that has been done to really identify new ways and new innovative ways to address the gaps that we've been able to see in the current, in the current context. And the role of the broader private sector or the broader civil society is not, is not just an innovative role, it's also an accountability role, making sure that what we're doing and the new 
changes or reforms that we're putting forward are actually reaching those that need to be reached. They do have a role in proper targeting, although the word targeting, let's say effective reach <laughs> of populations that need to be, to be reached and making sure that yes, that there is a, um, a sense of fairness, but also a sense of appropriateness of response. You know? So sometimes we see civil society as only voices of concern, but I think they have a very strong role to play in, in innovation and accountability, as well as the, uh, the, the broader, let's say, advocacy uh, role. No? When I was mentioning the private sector, I think that it, this is also the time to make sure that what are the new ways to make systems work efficiently. And I think it is, for, from one side, it was the, the, the long operation and expertise of the humanitarian sector that brought to the table very concrete ways of channeling res, uh, results, channeling um, uh, responses in context, which was very difficult to do. No? But we also need, I think, the other side of the innovation to come the technological solutions, the, the solutions that make systems much more agile and more effectively and transparent, which is also a very key element right now in terms of making sure that everybody knows where, where, where are the, the entitlements going, who is receiving, and what is the, the role and the impact that these are creating. So um, differently, I think it's, it's been very humble that the UN is very important and critical, but we need a much broader <laughs> a uh, multi-sector and multi-skilled set of actors to be able to address the real structural, in, in a very serious way, the real structural dimensions and constraints that we that this pandemic has very clearly highlighted. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Natalia. I, I, I like the term effective reach too. Uh, I think that's a good, uh, that's a good alternative to targeting, uh, given it's politically loaded. Um, uh, very, you know, very interesting ideas. Um, I, I like the concept of, uh, of you working with uh, actors that uh, uh, were uh, innovative because they needed to. And that's perhaps what I was alluding to earlier when I, when I uh, mentioned um, the, the people-led uh, mobilization. Uh, people stand up because they need to. People find solutions because they need to. People raise their voice because they have to. So um, I think engaging with these forces is, uh, will be paramount going, uh, going forward. And, uh, and I think, Sarah, what you were saying earlier about investing in the nuts and bolts, I'm sure if there are any of our uh, ESA colleagues listening, or, or certainly uh, any course participants from social security institutions nationally, I mean, they've been crying out for that, their, their, their key lesson, they, they want everybody to, to uh, 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 to really focus on is precisely that social security institutions where were stretched beyond their limit and where, where had to rise up but to continue to deliver their missions go well beyond their missions and and were part of this uh, ecosystem that you know delivering immediate emergency help to entire populations and so uh, the lesson there of course is that is precisely that building these systems, making sure that the administration, which Shara uh, talked about right at the beginning, you know, it's not just about policy, it's the right policy choices, it's not just about uh, 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 implementing those, it's not about fiscal space, just about that, but it's also the nuts and bolts, you know, the people on the ground to deliver the programs, and, uh, uh, and that's what ISA, our, uh, our friends from ISA keep uh, reminding us about. Um, Ben, over to you. Some some um, reactions, reflections on uh, on this final question, please. Yeah, I mean, I think in terms of uh, you know what I'm learning and what I would do differently is, I mean, one is certainly uh, you know change some of the the focus, the message, the the programs that we that we're pushing. And I think a lot of it has to do with this issue around again that we've discussed a lot is around the formality of employment. Yeah, which we always knew was there, but I don't think we gave it its its due in terms of of uh, the emphasis in terms of um, our work with with member governments, um, and also I, I think as well the issue around uh, migrants, both not not just international migrants, but not mig in, but uh, um, temporary and seasonal migrants within countries and uh, within within subregions. That um, again, one always intellectually knows of the of the difficulties they they face but you know just it, it becomes so uh, 
so much more clear and obvious with, with this crisis and the need to, to really much have a stronger focus. And I think that also leads to, uh, again, this whole discussion of the private sector. And the private sector is very heterogeneous, obviously. No? And I think there is, I mean, there's already a long history of work, you know, with the ILO in terms of the formal, bigger private sector, let's say, right? Um, but the mass, again, of the private sector, at least in terms of people or numbers, right, of, of individuals might be the informal, smaller uh, private sector, which is a much bigger challenge, right? Um, and I think so that's, which again leads, for us leads to, I mean, in a way we've always had this, uh, or at least I personally have always had a very, let's say, farmer-based bias, right? And um, and I think it's clear that um, it's, uh, you know, in, in terms of addressing the this pandemic as well as the broader issues of development as we go forward, we need a much uh, broader, uh, let's say, focus when we look at, certainly when we look at, at rural spaces, right? And we look at the food system transformation and it really is this informal, well, we use the term missing middle as well in, in agricultural economics. It doesn't refer to social protection, it refers to everything from farm gate to the consumer basically, uh, which really doesn't get a lot of policy attention either in numbers or anything, but actually is the motor of, of rural and economic development really. But I think finally the, I mean, I, I, I very much agree with what Sarah was saying in terms of the focus on the state and the importance of ultimately it's the state that has to uh, be the, you need national systems um, in order to get impact at scale. That's clear, right? Um, and so I, I, I think that's very important, uh, particularly for agencies like WFP. I mean, I think FAO, which has always been, let's say, statist, I think is perhaps excessively statist in a sense. And I think we need to actually move closer to civil society, as I was mentioning earlier and the need to um, uh, just, you know, just be much more open to thinking how can we make these big policy, these big changes, these systems without uh, re recognizing the constraints that states face in terms of capacity, in terms of institutions, and just all the tremendous energy that there is in, in local communities and different kind of, uh, of civil society organizations and how, and how they can, uh, let's say, build those systems. So it's not just exclusively dependent on um, the state. And so um, I think that's um, a big challenge for us in terms of just being much more open in terms of how we look at the, the problem of development, let's say. Thanks. Thank you, Ben. Um, I, I was struck by um, talking about informality, which is, uh, has been a recurrent theme today and you know, throughout the, uh, the webinars that we've run so far. Our colleague, um, Helmut Schwarzer, who um, presented the ILO's uh, latest research on uh, the labor market, well, the impact of COVID-19 on labor markets in Latin America was uh, saying that one of the emerging trends is now from informality to inactivity which is uh, going to be the next uh, big problem. So it's not just informal sector workers, but, uh, but people who just uh, totally lost all forms of livelihoods, uh, informal livelihoods. So, um, and particularly, I guess, uh, within that uh, uh, basket women. So um, uh, we'll go back to the gender issue, but I've, I've come to the, to the end of my, my questions, but there's been some interesting questions that have um, uh, popped up on our, um, Q and A um, chat, in particular, um, talking about value propositions, talking to the states and everything. Somebody was asking a very interesting question regarding pro growth strategies. Um, one of our panelists on Tuesday mentioned um, uh, that, and I, this I think has also um, popped up in uh, the research that FAO has done. Um, that the change in approach by by many governments. Um, shifting from perhaps neoliberal uh, approaches to, to spending or not spending, rather <laughs> cutting spending and, and social investment to uh, completely reversing those, uh, well, at least in the short term, but we don't know how long lived uh, these will be. So um, Stephen Kidd was saying, you know, we're, we're all uh, turning into uh, active, uh, Keynesian economics. Uh, in terms of uh, 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 shifting the paradigm and shifting the approach away from uh, uh, from from a neoliberal approach, um, somebody was mentioning uh, the the example of New Zealand in terms of offering an alternative vision while still maintaining and expanding social protection and and social spending. So, any thoughts on on that? Of course, this is the uh, this is the uh, 
uh, the, the shifting paradigm that uh, and the shifting context of the lay of the land that Sarah mentioned, not just in terms of the problems that we're facing, but also the political context that we might be uh, facing. Um, do we feel that that will, will change in any way? Are, are these alternatives uh, valid avenues for, for maintaining, sustaining this, this momentum in, in social protection? Any thoughts? I'm happy to come in while others are thinking. Is that okay? Yeah, should I continue? Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, so if I can also just pick up on the last question, I don't think I got the last question, which was about what you were asking about lessons learned. And, and, and I'll connect it to this question that was asked about New Zealand and about uh, whether countries, uh, lower middle income countries can do the same thing. Um, to say, I mean, I mean, for me, I think what, and for many, many people, I think the COVID kind of crisis in a way, I think, made very clear, not only, of course, we would all say the need for social protection systems, because countries that had it were much better able to respond than those that had very fragmented systems. Um, so obviously, that, that was one lesson. But also, I think the COVID crisis, in many ways, proved to us that there is still society. Remember that famous saying from um, a politician from the UK that there is no society? You know, we're all little islands unto ourselves. I think a pandemic, there's nothing better than a pandemic to show that you are as well off or as vulnerable as the most vulnerable in your community. No matter who you are, your well-being also depends on where the most vulnerable person in your community stands. And I think we've had through these decades of kind of neoliberalism, this idea that you can, you know, you can create your own little, you know, system and in individualized pensions, private schools, private healthcare systems, build very tall walls and separate yourself from everyone else. And I think a pandemic more than anything else shows that actually there is a commonality, there is a society and, uh, and in a way it's in your best interest to make sure that everyone else in your community is also protected. Um, so, and you would think, I mean, um, the same lesson should have been learned globally. A pandemic and a virus in one country is not going to stay confined to one country, no matter how many borders and barriers you set up. So there is this issue of solidarity, and that's really, I think, what uh, is fundamentally also underpins a social protection system. The idea that we are living in a society, we contribute according to our means, uh, you know, we pay taxes based on, you know, how much we earn and there are more progressive systems, you pay a higher percentage if you're among the 5% or 1%, ideally, uh, this is what you would like to get to. So this idea of solidarity, I think, is, is really important. And I, I'm not suggesting that that lesson has been learned and that everyone is now willing to be you know, part of this very solidaristic society within countries and also globally, that the rich countries recognize that it's also in their own self-interest to create a global environment where poor countries can also protect themselves and have proper you know, um, healthcare systems and social protection systems. But, but that is a lesson that one would think that this pandemic should have taught us. How much that lesson has been learned, I'm not sure, but our hope is that that lesson has been learned and that will pave the way to really create systems that are, you know, universal, that are robust, that are inclusive, and that are built on the basis of solidarity. I think that's a really important point. The second, I mean, I, I do want to come back to this whole question around the role of the state, which I think we all agree is really important. And there's been some really interesting stuff written by many people, um, including, um, Mazzucato uh, about the role of the state um, in, in really needing to sort of recognize that and, and enable states to play the role that they should be playing. I think that's really important. But I also do think we're very aware we don't want the strong man states, right? This, the authoritarian states. We don't want that. We want democratic states that are accountable. And for that, you do need to have very strong um, yes, uh, social partners and civil society organizations. And I think that links to that question that was asked about, you know, communities. And that's, you know, we're not there yet in many countries, not even in the so-called democracies. You know, we don't have strong civil society that can really create that state society kind of exchange that we need in order to build systems that are truly accountable um, and in which everyone can have a voice and everyone can uh, claim their entitlements and their rights. So I think that's a project that's in the making 
even in so-called democracies. Uh, this idea that you have an accountable state, you build up the state, but you also have civil society that holds the state to account. So I think that's something that is very important, particularly uh, you know, for social protection systems. It's also extremely important if we recognize that they have to be rights-based. And finally, I think, in, uh, and I really like this whole discussion around universalism. Yes, we don't want a difference blind universalism. You know, we want a universalism that is uh, very responsive to different needs and uh, that is also, you know, we used to call this targeting within un universalism, that you have tailor-made approaches within universalism, not the same recipe for everyone. You know, for your indigenous community, you need to deliver services in very different ways, you know, using the local languages, making sure that transport systems uh, are taken care of so that people can access services. So you just need to have that uh, flexibility and proactiveness to be very um, responsive to specific needs of particularly marginalized groups in order to make sure that the universal kind of actually reaches and meets their needs. And finally, I think there's been a little bit of an elephant in the room as we've been talking, maybe because we're all UN agencies and we take it for granted. But um, Sarah mentioned at several, several different points, you know, the vision that we have. And the vision is not something that's just in our heads. I think what we also have as uh, UN agencies, and we have a whole set of you know, human rights normative standards that we stand on. And those standards, in a way, sometimes, you know, when you look at them, you want, they are very visionary, that you cannot believe that, you know, people came up with this in 19, you know, 51 or in 1945, UDHR said this and, you know, and, and, and really, I think those standards are really important and they are kind of the ground on which we stand as UN agencies, you know, we're not voted into office, you know, we have those important standards that are kind of our anchor and our reference point. And that doesn't mean that what was said, you know, uh, so many years ago is, you know, valid in terms of every single, you know, detail, of course, you need to interpret it. And that's why, you know, we have all the different bodies that do that. But those standards are our anchor and they do have a lot of uh, visionary, um, I think, um, uh, lessons for us. Um, and, uh, you know, this idea of universalism and solidarity is very much coming from those standards. And we see through the test of times that, you um, it, it does it does stand up to scrutiny and it works much better than you know getting having your markets do everything and and not sort of building the kind of society that you need um, so I think that reference point is really important and um, and that's why I think we need social protection systems that are very much anchored within those standards um, that um, that are very much about sort of the human rights principles that uh, I think we're all as UN agencies very um, committed to. Um, so let me end there and add if there are any other points that come up, I'll be happy to come in. Thank you. Thank you, Shara. I think we're, we're moving on to sort of closing remarks uh, because of the time, but uh, um, I, I like what you were saying about the, the, you know, the fundamental standards, of course, and, and unfortunately, I'm sure we're all aware that these were being increasingly questioned uh, as, as uh, multilateralism as well itself. Was, uh, has been under attack of late. And if we think, as you did just now, about the origin of these, uh, of these fundamental declarations, mostly you know, coming up after the Second World War, I wonder if, uh, if this uh, global shock uh, has breathed new life into these fundamentals. And I, I'm with you, you know, we definitely need to go back to them and, and defend them with, with all, all we can. So um, I think, um, Ben, um, the original question was, was around sort of uh, pro-growth, alternatives to, to pro-growth, but I think that I said we're moving, you know, to closing remarks. So if, uh, I think if you want to react to, to anything that has been said, you know, in the last few minutes, and, and uh, I don't know if you have any strong views on, on the question that was posed, but, uh, but if not, any, any closing remarks would, uh, would do us very well. Great, thanks, yeah. Just, I mean, I think, just this issue of whether the kind of the let's say the fundamental approach to uh, to development has changed with COVID, right? This comment around how we've all become you know Keynesians, basically. And I mean, I, I, this this crisis is quite particular, right? And so, I mean, it's a kind of economic crisis where actually all the economic fundamentals are still okay, right? I mean, it's not like there's uh, I mean nothing went out of whack. It was it was a health shock which which led to this. Um, 
crisis, right? And so it's kind of in this particular crisis where, uh, I mean, it's kind of a no-brainer to pump cash into the economy. There's really nothing else governments can do to get demand going again when just all of a sudden, you know, a large portion of the population is not working, you know, uh, and economic activity has stopped, right? And so um, I, I have a, I don't think it necessarily in and of itself is 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 leading to a change in you know in in you know process of development, but I mean but it also I think I mean and again responding to I guess you know the, the comments of a number of the panelists around, I mean I think it, it it's changed in ways which we don't really know yet kind of the perceptions and attitudes and the way people react and they live and they and they view I mean society and politics I'm sure right um, and uh, and I think. I mean, and you see bits and pieces of that. I mean, I think a lot of this is happening very locally, right? So it's hard for, you know, at least for me to see, right? But I, in, we, we, I see it myself just in terms of, you know, the calls, for example, in, in, in food and agriculture, it's, the, it's you know, the, the, the fragility of food systems, right? The importance of uh, focusing on shorter supply chains, right? So that brings up this whole debate again around the importance of local, more local production, more locally sourced production, right? Uh, or valuing in, you know, the fragility of longer of longer supply chains um, in terms of evaluating the, you know, the economics of, of supporting so shorter supply chains, right? And so, and that can give a big boost to, again, to more localized production in, in given countries, right? And so that, I mean, that actually is a big, that could be a significant shift, right? And actually be, be a big boost to a lot of rural areas, um, uh, uh, if it kind of continues, right? And I think it's very clearly also the st stronger role of, of civil society in, in, in many different manifestations, right? But again, these are just like little signals that one sees, but it's hard, for me, it's hard to understand yet how things have changed, right? Again, it's my own kind of shortness of vision, I think, and my, my inability to see, you know, big things and actually imagine big changes, right? But I think there could be really, you know, fundamental changes that just haven't, at least I, I don't understand yet. Thanks. I think that's absolutely right, Ben. Um, what I said right at the beginning was that we're, I think we're still in the eye of the storm, to be honest. So um, it's it's very hard to see the wood for the trees when you're when you're right in the middle of something. So I think we're all doing a, a brilliant exercise of, of trying to step back and, and and look ahead today. But at the end of the day, the evidence is only just emerging. And as you're saying, you know, we have learned lessons, and and uh, I think we've been clear about identifying some of these lessons. But we're still learning and and the, the crisis is still evolving very very quickly and we don't know what trajectory even even just the health emergency is, is going to take will it come back you know i i know i i'm reading your scenarios of course uh, that that always comes back we don't know will, will there be a second wave you know that will create even more disruption and and, and havoc of all sorts so um uh, i would like to um end with uh, Natalia just for some final final remarks and just you know one that you know maybe lessons and then I think everybody will have had a chance to uh, uh, to uh, articulate their views. Final words? Children, children, children. <laughs> um, no I'm, I'm, I was trying to think right and, and, and I think what you just said at the end was critical that I it's it's a little bit frustrating that we're still in in the middle of the process that it's that it's looking as if it, this is a protracted crisis and that we're learning in the making where we're making a lot of mistakes but at the same time trying to very quickly understand what are the things that we can we can take on that are, that are already happening all the things that i was mentioning about the political commitment around the systems um i think it's it's clear and i think all of you have mentioned that this is the moment where issues of exclusion and inequality are very at the front of what is what has been highlighted, no? And that it's no longer, that, and that it gives us working in the UN and in human rights organization, a very powerful argument to, to, to tangibly, tangibly show why it's important to increase investment in, in closing these gaps. That it's not just a matter of because it's right or because the CRC and the Agenda 2030, but because it's something that is gonna impact in the long term, everybody living in a society, no? Um, I think we've seen, although hopefully not, but and hopefully we'll see more of a lot of voices of groups that were initially not visible in, in many of the of the economic processes that we've seen um, and that now somewhere or the other are becoming a bit more more visible and and, and i hope that we have the the humility but also the 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 strategic thinking of, of making those voices much more visible and trying to to listen to them a bit more or what is really 
uh, missing, what is really not being addressed effectively and how really to use their, listen a bit more to think to, to the people in the ground that are being, um, be, being part of the structural inequalities for a very long time. And this is the, the only moment that we, I think we have to be able to address them a bit better. Um, for me that I've been working in social protection for a bit, it's always been very difficult to to make the, the rights case, no? And, and, and I've been somebody that's been really pushing and we need to make a very stronger economic case and a very, you know, investment case. And hopefully that now that even though it, the, the pandemic has touched people differently and, and showed inequalities, it's touched everybody in some way. So it created also the, um, the need that, yes, I also want to be protected. I also would like to have a safety net if something happens to me, even if you're not necessarily extremely poor, but you are in, you know, in the middle income or in some way or another, you're also being impacted. No? And, and maybe we come back to the initial of the social protection programs in Latin America. That's what was the game changer, that it was, you know, the middle class that started to say, well, okay, yes, there's, this is something that I can understand because there's there's also a benefit for for me. Maybe it's, it's it's cynical and it's not the way the right way of going, but it's we need to take advantage of that overall recognition that now this is no longer just a a passive agenda or agenda for only that should care for those working in poverty reduction. This is an economic development agenda that needs to be at the center of many of our processes. No, and, and coming back to our initial obvious statement that it, social protection should be part of many broad economic transformation policies, not just the social policies, not just the inclusive policies, but also the broader policies that are looking for economic growth and, and inclusive development. So let's hope there's some sort of a change in the perspective of many of our of our governments and leaders as we move as we move forward. Thank you, Natalia. I've, I've, I've always been a rights person as well. And I get very annoyed when people say that you, that's not enough. Um, Sarah has, uh, has asked to make a final comment, which is, uh, uh, which is great. So uh, over to you, Sarah, and then we'll wrap up. Well, um, it's, hard to end, uh, it's hard to end a COVID webinar on a positive note, <laughs> but then I thought we should try. So, um, no, I, th I thought you wanted us each to just give a, a wrap up comment. Anyway, my, my attempt at a positive note is, it's true, we don't know really what's gonna happen um, at all to the world, but um, we do at least have something, which is we know where we have a destination in mind from a social protection point of view, we have a destination in mind. And it comes back to what we were saying at various points in this webinar about the, the, the USP uh, 2030. So I think um, that destination is still relevant and we're still on the right road. We were on the right road before COVID and we're still on that, on that same road. So I just think um, maybe we're passing a lot more accidents uh, on, on, on that road, but at least the, it's the, it's the same. we're trying to get to the same place. So that's a little bit better than having to have a fundamental rethink about what it is that we, you know, what kind of society it is that we want to have. That's I couldn't have thought of a better way to, to end, Sarah. I think, brilliant end. Uh, continuing with your, um, uh, with your road, I think the only thing that we're, we're trying that maybe has changed or has, uh, is we're learning is how to travel on that road to get a better, faster perhaps, or, or certainly not get, go off the road. So uh, I, would, um, I would say that there are still uh, things that we can learn about that and, and the context has changed perhaps, but I completely agree with you and I'm sure that everybody else does. We've, we've come to the end of our time, but we've used these two hours very effectively. Uh, I think it's, it's been a very conceptually, very intellectually engaging discussion, I think for everyone. It's been fantastic to have you all uh, 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 on this panel. I am sure that everybody listening has been thoroughly inspired. Uh, they're all facing uh, different challenges where they are we all are, uh, to a lesser or greater extent, different nature, we're all different. But, uh, but I would continue to say that COVID has touched all our lives in one way or another, and, uh, uh, and it will continue to do so for a long time uh, as it morphs into, into a, a, an even more complex crisis. So thank you so much for your contribution.
uh, panelists, esteemed panelists, and, uh, and for your views and for your thoughts. Um, and thank you to all the people uh, who have been listening to us. Uh, we hope for those of you that are on the course, there's still uh, uh, more to go. We're still on this learning journey together. So stay with us and I hope uh, uh, this session will have given you even more ideas uh, as, as we now begin to look ahead, as I said right at the very beginning. So uh, farewell. Mm -hmm.